Good evening and welcome to AOPA Air Safety Institute presents Weather Flying, Safety for All Seasons. Tonight is episode one in our three-part series and it's entitled ATC and You, Don't Let That Cloud Fool You. My name is John Collins and I'm the manager of aviation safety programs for ASI. And joining me tonight is Eric Schoenard. He is a uh, controller in the Seattle Center. He's been a controller for about 25 years, the last 17 of which have been in Seattle, and uh, probably another seven out in other uh, ATC operations, I believe in towers. So I'll let him talk about that. Uh, a few administrative things before we begin and get into things. Uh, first of all, uh, you should have your volume turned up. We will be running three videos during the course of tonight's webinar. So if you have any audio or video issues, you may just want to log out and log back in. That usually clears up any of those problems. I'm unable to troubleshoot for you while we're in the middle of this, but uh, that has usually worked in the past. Also, we are recording the webinar, so if you miss any part of it or you have to leave or you come in late, and you want to catch the beginning, uh, by all means, it will be up on our website tomorrow at webinars.aopa.org, and it will also be posted to the Air Safety Institute YouTube channel. So look for those there. Tonight's webinar is eligible for WINGS credit, and that will be sent to your WINGS account if you registered with the email that you used to register at faasafety.gov. Um, we'll send that to you. You should see that in your account by uh, close of business, business on Monday. Um, this also uh, is eligible for an AOPA webinar badge uh, in the AOPA pilot app. And at the end of the presentation, I will tell you how you can get that, as well as a way that you can make sure that this is credited to your e-learning ASI transcript. So with all that said, before I turn things over to Eric, we'd like to take a quick set of polls to find out who we have uh, with us tonight, who we're talking to. So the first question is, what level of pilot certificate do you hold? None. Are you a recreational or a sport pilot, a private pilot, a commercial pilot, or an airline transport pilot? Please go ahead and answer those questions there. I'll keep it open here for a little bit. And while we're coming in, it looks like we have a lot of private pilots, some commercial pilots, about 25% uh, of you, give or take, and about 9% ATPs. A few of you don't have a certificate yet. That's okay. Um, hopefully you're student pilots and uh, you're here watching this so you can expand your knowledge of weather and how ATC can help you. All right, we're coming up. We've got about 75% of you who have uh, answered the poll. We'll let it run for a few more seconds and I'll share the answers here. All right, there we go. Got about 80% of you have voted. Go ahead and close the poll, and I'm going to share the results. All right, most of you are private pilots, so welcome. Thank you for, for doing that. No recreational sport pilots, so uh, we'll have to see about uh, getting back out to that community a little bit more so we can get them involved in this as well. And then, uh, so there we have that. Our next question, do you hold an instrument rating? And the answer is yes but not current or proficient, yes, but and current, but not proficient, or yes, I am current and proficient, or you don't hold an instrument rating at all. So go ahead and answer those if you don't mind. And if you're wondering about that current but not proficient, you've done an IPC, or you've met the instrument rating uh, requirements for currency, but maybe you haven't flown instruments in a while, maybe you're in your fifth or sixth month getting ready to maybe go out of currency. So. All right, we'll go ahead and uh, get that just about done there. Very good. All right, I'm going to close the poll and we'll see what we've got. A little less than half of you have said, no, you don't have an instrument rating. 28% of you current and proficient, 9% current but not proficient. And 18%, uh, yes, you have a rating, but you're not current and proficient. Unfortunately, I currently find myself in that same situation. So I'm sympathizing with you. We need to get out there and uh, do some more do some more flying. So um, I'm going to hide that one. The last question I have for you, very simple. want to know if we've got any flight instructors in the crowd tonight. Uh, yes 
or no. Um, if you're a ground instructor, by all means, go ahead and select that. Uh, if you are an instructor, but you're not actively instructing, that's cool. Uh, you're still looked to as a source of information in the flying community, and we do appreciate your knowledge and experience. And if you are actively instructing, way to go. Uh, you are the front line of safety for the general aviation population, and you're the one that pilots will see and talk to. So please, uh, please continue to do that. We're going to keep this open for a few more seconds. Most of you are not flight instructors. Okay. Uh, about 3% of you are ground instructors only. 12% are flight instructors not actively instructing. 4% of you are actively instructing. You take some time away from doing that to be with us tonight. I want to thank you for that. I'm going to share those results here in a moment. There we go. So that's what we have here in attendance tonight. I really appreciate uh, you answering the questions. I'm sure more people are going to continue to trickle in here as we go uh, forward in the hour. But uh, Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, give you the opportunity to go ahead and uh, get involved in this. We've got some great information, some really interesting case studies. So Eric, you have the controls. All righty. Do I? I'm not seeing the sharing screen right offhand. Am I am I good to go here now? I'm good? Are you seeing You're my good. screen? Okay. Yes. Yep, All right. Got Perfect. Thank you. So thanks for having me out here. Uh, again, my name is Eric Schnard. I have, uh, I guess it'd be just under 25 years of experience. It was out in New York where I first got hired. I worked at White Plains Tower and LaGuardia Tower uh, for the first seven years. And then I wanted to get closer to home, so I moved back towards Seattle. Uh, I've been at Seattle Center down in Auburn, Washington for the past 17 years. Uh, I work uh, the B area, which we uh, do low and high altitude from Olympia, Washington to Eugene, Oregon, and from the ocean to Baker City, Oregon is the airspace that I control. We have eight different sectors that we have to be certified on. Um, takes about three years to get checked out there. Uh, it's a great place to work though. Um, we did the, uh, we made these this briefing and about five others uh, for this exact audience. People, uh, general aviation mostly, uh, DFR pilots mostly, uh, we do emergencies, weather, basic radar services. This is one that the union has built to provide to pilots to get information out to pilots so they, they wanna talk to us, they're not afraid to talk to us, and that we can get on the same page and, and get everybody the services they need. Um, like I said, we built these for Oshkosh. The union sends about 25 controllers out there every year on the their own time, their own dollar, the controllers go out there to be able to brief these pilots. So it's a, a great time for us to do that. This is one of the briefings that we built for that. Um, and it's all about what we can do with our weather equipment, what we need from you guys and your weather equipment or your observations out the window and how we can get the best services for everybody by knowing the big picture. Uh, we talked a little bit about pilot experience. Uh, I came about air traffic through a college training initiative. I got a degree in air traffic control. And in order to do that, I had uh, was required to get my private pilot's license. Uh, I have not flown since the day I got it as a sophomore in college. So I am neither current nor proficient as a pilot. Uh, so I would like help from you guys in knowledge and information of what you guys have in your planes so that I can put it together with what I have at work and we can get that best picture for everybody. So again, this is gonna take your guys' knowledge and you guys understanding what your capabilities and limitations of your equipment are and then I will explain what our equipment is during this briefing, and we can see how we work, work through everything the best. So as you can see, most accidents of any kind of accident happens in Part 91, GA aircraft. Of those accidents in total, about a third of them are weather related. And of those third, 75% of them are fatalities. 
So weather in GA is a big, big issue. Um, a couple more interesting facts that aren't on this slide is that most, well, I'm sorry, that's on the side. All right, so weather's very big in the, the GA um, Part 91 flying. And, it, and so that's why we spend so much time trying to get this knowledge out there. Um, it's a highly emphasized tool at work that we take PI reps, we disseminate PI reps. Um, every hour we got to collect the tops and bases at the IFR airports. And it's, it's a highly emphasized tool that we need to pass on to the pilots. So like I said before, it is most definitely a team effort. We, we need information from the pilots. The only thing, the only thing weather related that we see on the radar scope is precipitation. And that's oftentimes not understood by pilots. We get asked for um, clouds ahead or how to, where, how to get around them, and, and we can't give that information. We just don't have it. The only thing we see is precipitation. So this is why we need to make it a team effort from the pilots to get turbulence reports, tops, bases, um, icing. We need that information from one pilot to be able to give the others. I kind of compare it a lot to the Waze driving app. You got Google and Apple and Waze, they're all different tools that show a map of where to go. But Waze is a, a good map because you can input, each driver can input what they see. So a speed trap ahead, construction, a car accident, my favorite one is an animal carcass on the road. They take all that information and Waze puts it together and then disseminates it all to all the users. It's the same concept with us. The pilots, air traffic control, we all have the map that we're using that shows where to go, where the terrain is, but, and a lot of the pilots will have the, the precipitation part of that, the weather radar, but what we don't have is everybody else's input. We don't have icing unless somebody reports that to us. We have forecasted tops and bases and forecasted winds, but we don't actually have that unless somebody gives it to us. So in order to keep the, the big picture, we need all that input from the pilots. And then one of the biggest things too is it's timely. Weather doesn't always show up on time, whether it's the weather radar to our screen or weather radar to the cockpit or um, pyreps that get given to flight service and then disseminated out to uh, pre-flight briefings and all that. It's, it's not always timely. When I have it on my radar scope from a pilot 15 minutes earlier, it's, it's timely. I know that the next airplane through there is going to get the same, the same type of flight conditions. So most accidents, I think this was a 10-year average back in 2014. Most accidents have to do with weather as a causal factor. And the biggest causal factor is adverse winds. Variable, high, cross and tail winds, wind gusts, wind shifts. Winds are a big issue with the accidents. I know with the little bit of time flying I had, crosswinds. Man, I could not become friends with crosswinds. That's probably one of the reasons why I ended up not continuing to fly is just not being able to make the landings with the crosswinds. So here's some common myths about air traffic and weather. Again, we cannot see, there's only one thing we can see. We can't see it all. The only thing we get is precipitation. Everything else is our pre-weather duty brief. We have forecasts of where it's gonna be IFR, what the winds are gonna be, where there's gonna be turbulence, where there's gonna be icing. It's all forecasts. The only thing we actually see is the precipitation on the scope. Um, most accurate picture. So in the past, under our last 
weather radar tool, we were way delayed, way delayed. And controllers were getting the information of precipitation, thunderstorms way faster than their traffic was. Um, so that created a lot of issues, but times have, we've got a new Nextrad radar and it's, it's much better. So that's definitely a myth that we have the most accurate but it, it is better than what it had been in the past. Um, the only way we can see the big picture though is from getting information from both pilots of multiple planes all over the sky, putting it together and then being able to individually give it to each plane as they enter particular areas that, that have that weather going on with it. So Eric, there's a question that's come in. Um, do you want that information unsolicited or are you going to ask for it specifically? From the so it's, if you have something to give, give it. It's, um, it, there are times possibly, if you can tell a controller's busy, not, and you can't get that word in edgewise, it may not be the best time to do it. Um, you can always go to flight service and issue the PIREP, and then that PIREP will eventually get back to us but it won't be as timely as giving it to the controller themselves. Um, we'll, in just a little bit, we'll come up with the, uh, what we have to report as PIREP. So like, like light turbulence isn't as big of a deal, but if it's moderate, I, got, I, got, I need it, I want it, and I have to um, publish it. So if you have something that affects your flight and you think another pilot wants to know then absolutely helps and that's the best way to describe it if it's something out there that you think another pilot wants to know absolutely tell us great thank you very much a good question matt thank you for that so completing the big picture um the first one is kind of multifaceted if you need help for weather then by all means get on the radio, interrupt, let it be known that, that you need help. But one thing that we always like to stress with the asking for help is, and, and I'll, I'll prove it to you in a, a, a video that we'll watch here in just a little bit, but we can't stress enough, you should already be on the radio. You should already be talking to us, getting flight following. Because when something comes up, and you now have to get a hold of us, and you're already starting to get into trouble, you're stacking the deck against you. So now asking for help, just plain language. At, if, if you're in trouble, just tell us what you need, what, what the problem is and what you need. And then we'll get, we will start to ask you the questions that we need further beyond that. But, but don't be talking in code, just tell us what the problem is. Um, the capabilities, again, we only show precipitation. I can't stress that enough. The other reports that we're giving are all from pilots. They're, they're all from you guys flying. That's the only way we can get them other than forecasts. And, and I'm not advertising forecasts to you guys. When I'm sitting at the radar scope, I'm not giving you forecasts. You can go to flight service for that. I'm only giving what I know from other planes. Uh, and then knowing your equipment capability, because um, like I said, I don't know what you guys have in your plane. So all I can tell you is what, what I know from other pilots and what I know from precipitation. Um, so if, if you got something else to add and, and you trust your equipment better or not as much, make sure that, that you, you know what your capabilities are and decide what you wanna do as far as following where other airplanes might be flying because of a weather cell that I provide you, or if, if your equipment's telling you different, you need to know what your equipment is going, is the capabilities are and, and decide which way you wanna go. I'm not gonna tell you which way to go. I will suggest where other airplanes have gone and I will tell you what I know, but you need to make the final decision on which way you wanna go around weather. ADIS and PIREPS, like I said, give the PIREPS. If you've got something that you think another pilot wants to know, give the PIREP. ADISs, uh, we don't get them in the in route environment. In the tower, um, we 
they they cut them they make the atis they have the weather we can read the weather um in en route too but if if you're just out flying get the weather get the atis go get it yourself if you get in trouble we will gladly give it to you if you if you start to encounter a situation we will gladly gladly give that weather to you but if you're not in a situation yet do yourself a favor pre-flight get the weather get the pyre ups listen to atises as you get near your destination and and that's one thing that air traffic is required to do is give make sure all airplanes landing have atis or weather um asos all that that they have the current weather and they have the notums so if you don't have it we're going to make you go get it and like i said if, if you're in trouble we will get it for you but um, if you're just joe schmo flying around and didn't want to get it yourself if you want apc to do it you're probably not going to have a lot of happy people giving it to you all the time and uh, one other comment uh, eric on uh, on pyreps and this is from um uh, Jeff up in Southeast Alaska, he says flying up there, he counts on good pie reps too, not just negative weather. So something to, to keep in mind is that, you know, if you're out there and you're seeing good stuff, uh, you want to let people know as well, because that may be an escape route for them. So uh, pass those along as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll discuss this a little bit now. A good pie rep is not a mandatory pie rep for me to fill out and give to the flight data and have it sent out. But it will always be known in my head. It, I may draw on my scope with a little draw feature and, and I know which airports are good. Um, so light turbulence would be another one. I don't need to report that and I typically won't report it, but at least I know where, where it is. So that when somebody gets moderate turbulence at 11,000 and I know that 9,000 was good, I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna to suggest to the pilot. Go back to 9,000 because that's where the better ride is. So um, I agree with what they said on that. It will not always make it out to um, like a flight service dissemination mm -hmm. when it's good weather. Uh, the way to ensure that is going to, to the flight service and, and passing it through them. But if you're, if, you're, if you're filing it through a controller, the weather will be taken. It will be noted, but if it's good, it may not necessarily come out in print form for you to find it if, if you were checking on it per se down the road. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, we are and, and we are required to find out. Like when I plug in at six o'clock in the morning after the night shift, I need and I get my first airplane into Newport, Oregon, I need to find out what the tops and bases are. And if it's good, I know it's good. If it's bad, I then need to fill out that pie rep and do that on an hourly basis until it clears up. So that is true. So we're gonna talk about weather emergencies um, in this presentation. We have three video, or I'm sorry, two videos we're gonna play. It'll be VFR aircraft and IFR conditions. We did take out the flying in the thunderstorms video. Um, the biggest thing that it does is no gyro vectors. Um, the, the airplane in that emergency uh, lost some equipment and was flying in severe thunderstorms and needed help getting away from it. So it's, it was no gyro vectors, which was is gonna be done in this first video with BFR aircraft and IFR conditions. They just did it with non-standard phraseology and it, it, it was done just a little differently, but it was still a type of no gyro vector. So I'll discuss it and what you might see if, if that can, um, type of issue ever arises. And the third one is an icing video, um, which is a, a really good video too. These, all these videos are, um, so they're, they're basically safe. They're, they're where a pilot got in trouble, air traffic work with the pilot and numerous air traffic controllers. And, and we feel it, it saved the life of the pilot. And we have a conference every year uh, the controllers do communicating for safety and we award these controllers that have these saves with a a plaque and and mention and whatnot it's a very very neat ceremony and we, we do it one for every region there's nine regions in the in the fa as far as the way the the facilities work and it is a very emotional night to see these videos 
and how the controllers work together with the pilot and got him out of trouble. And a lot of times these pilots end up coming and meeting the controller that night for the first time. It's, it's a very, very neat um, conference we do. So this first video is a, IFR, a VFR aircraft in IFR conditions. And so I'll give you a little setup. Uh, this is just near Seattle. Um, this is a radar scope of an approach control. This was Seattle approach that worked this. Uh, the data block it says RCH384. That is a, a, a data block that we track an airplane with. So that's Reach 384. It's a military aircraft. The next line, 091, he's at 9,100 feet. 26 is 260 knots over the ground. TCM, he's landing McCord Airfield. It's a C-17. The little line going down to the E, that E is the airplane. That's the target of the airplane. The E is the controller working that aircraft. It's the E scope of Seattle approaches working that, that aircraft. So that's what you're gonna see on the, the next data block that pops up. This uh, 5800 with a asterisk right there is a VFR aircraft squawking 1200. So that little asterisk is a 1200 transponder code not talking to anybody and that 5800 is the altitude we are currently receiving it is unverified because we have not talked to the pilot to show him that we show 5800 5800 feet and he has not came back and said that's correct that's what i'm at so that is an unverified altitude which is basically worthless to me at this point because if he's got a bad altimeter then that altitude is is not right and and i don't know what he's at so until i can verify it that altitude doesn't mean a whole lot to me the other important part of this are these the little numbers that are on the radar scope the lighter green 52 57 the 53 this is an emergency obstruction video map this is the eobm is what you pull up as soon as an aircraft discusses that they're having an issue you pull up your eobm this is the absolute minimum altitude an airplane can be at Near that 5,700, that means that the ground, the actual ground is, is at 5,700 in that vicinity. So as you can see moving west, it, it goes to 52, 46, 42. And what you can't really see, but we really kind of need to, is, is in the big area that's kind of wide open with no numbers, It that's 2,500. The, the highest terrain in that area is 2,500. So that's what's gonna become important in this video. So now I'll, I'll let you watch this video. This is Fort Columbia approach, go ahead. I'm lost in the clouds in the mountains at a VFR pilot. Verify your full call sign, please. Four Quebec, 70 Fort Quebec Romeo. So, sir, 740 Quebec Romeo, squawk 0334. 0334. All right, help me. There are 740 Quebec Romeo, you are radar contact 32 miles south southeast of the SeaTac Airport. Seattle altimeter is 3011, verify your altitude. 3011, altitude is uh, 6000. Then reserve Quebec Romeo, roger. Turn left, heading 250 or table. Left 250. Then reserve Quebec Romeo, say type aircraft please. Cessna 150. Left heading 250, correct? Number 0, Quebec Romeo, affirmative 250 on the heading. I was just going to get you westbound. There's a lower NBA to the west. Copy. Number 0, Quebec Romeo, I would maintain your current altitude. Proceed westbound on the 250 heading. Something to head westbound. Number 0, Quebec Romeo, it appears you're going eastbound, sir. I need you to go westbound. Copy, turning westbound. I'm having some uh, compass issues. I'm not sure what's happening. Number zero, Quebec Romeo, Roger. Turn left, and now stop your turn. Number zero, Quebec Romeo, just fly straight, sir. Number zero, Quebec Romeo, fly straight. Keep your altitude. Fly straight. Maintaining altitude. Flying straight. Number zero, Quebec Romeo. Turn right, and I will tell you to stop turning in a minute. Turn right. Turning right. Slow. Number eight, Sierra, proceed direct normie on navigation. Direct normie on navigation, eight, Sierra. November zero, Quebec Romeo. Continue to turn right, sir. I need you to turn right on a slow turn, and I'll tell you when to stop. Turning right, four, Quebec Romeo. November zero, Quebec Romeo. Stop turn, just fly straight now. 
I remember Zero Quebec Romeo, stop your turn and fly straight. November Zero Quebec Romeo, I'm not receiving any response. Just stop your turn and fly straight. Zero Quebec Romeo, straight flight. November Zero Quebec Romeo, turn right again. Turn right, slow right turn. Slow right turn for Quebec Romeo. Zero Quebec Romeo, is it, is it VFR conditions once they get out of the mountains right now? Zero Quebec Romeo, I'll get you over here in a moment, and I have had people get VFR conditions to turn with this. Zero Quebec Romeo, the biggest thing is maintain your current altitude. Zero Quebec Romeo, maintain your current altitude. Maintaining altitude for Quebec Romeo. Maintaining altitude for Quebec Romeo. Altitude for Quebec Romeo, maintain your current altitude. Altitude for Quebec Romeo, maintaining altitude for Quebec Romeo. Altitude for Quebec Romeo, maintaining altitude for Quebec Romeo. Altitude for Quebec Romeo, maintaining altitude for Quebec Romeo. Altitude for Quebec Romeo, maintaining altitude for Quebec Romeo. Altitude for Quebec Romeo, maintaining altitude for Quebec Romeo. Altitude for Quebec Romeo, maintaining altitude for Quebec Romeo. Altitude for Quebec Romeo, maintaining altitude for Quebec Romeo. Altitude for Quebec Romeo, maintaining altitude Zero Quebec Romeo, you're drifting to the top a little bit. Turn right, just slowly turn right again. Slow right turn for Quebec Romeo. And this is for Quebec Romeo. My intent was to go towards Sawing Field, but really anywhere in Seattle land is fine at this point. Zero Quebec Romeo, Roger, stop your turn, just fly straight now. Flying straight for Quebec Romeo. Remember Zero Quebec Romeo, now turn left slowly, left slow turn. Left. Slow left turn for Quebec Romeo. Number zero, Quebec Romeo, stop your turn. Stopping turn for Quebec Romeo. November zero, Quebec Romeo, how many people are on board, on board sir? Four. November zero, Quebec Romeo, how many people are on board? Four Quebec Romeo, two souls on board. Two souls on board, thank you. November zero, Quebec Romeo, in about five miles, we're going to be able to get you lower. I'm just evacuating you around the mountains that I have right now. Copy. How much longer until you think I can see for Quebec Romeo? Um, you'll be able to see when you get uh, when you descend. So just keep your altitude for now, and when I get you lower, you'll be able to get, you'll be able to see. I get you down here. Uh, I get you down lower, 2,500 feet here in a moment. Copy. Number zero, Quebec Romeo. If I give you lower, is your equipment working so you can get lower? Uh, I think so, but I need you to keep watching my heading. No, I watch your heading. Number zero, Quebec Romeo. Send to 3,000. Let's try that first. 3,000. Remember, Zero Quebec Romeo, you're doing great, sir. I'll show you 5,300. Affirmative. Remember, Zero Quebec Romeo, now turn left. Flight left turn for Quebec Romeo. And remember, Zero Quebec Romeo, I'm in your altitude. Just descend and maintain 4,200. 4,200. Let's show you 4,900. 4,200 for Quebec Romeo. Remember, Zero Quebec Romeo. Stop your turn. Now you can descend and maintain 2,500. 2,500. Quebec Romeo, I show you living 4,300 now. For Quebec Romeo, I can see. Zero Quebec Romeo, you have you have a good line of sight with the ground? I have full horizon. I have the sound in front of me. I fully good. Zero Quebec Romeo, thank you, sir. Maintain VFR conditions. Copy. Thank you so much again for Quebec Romeo. My pleasure. On that video, um, I talked earlier about getting flight following from air traffic. The pilot, the pilot got into trouble and it took 45 seconds for him to call air traffic and get identified with his, ident his call sign type position. And the that's 45 seconds it took to, get, to even find out what the pilot is, much less to find out what the problem is. According to an FAA study, aircraft in weather distress has 173 seconds to get out of it alive. After 173 seconds, the chances of getting out of that weather issue is drastically increased. So this pilot took 45 seconds of that 173 just to find out where he is and what his problem is. Had he been talking with air traffic, it would have, that's 45 more seconds he gets to, to help get out of the problem. Um, that video was just under six minutes. So he was in the clouds for roughly six minutes. Uh, he was over the 52 and the 5300 foot terrain 
and you probably saw his altitude is 58. He was at 59 over the 53, so he was 600 feet above ground at in the clouds, totally not being able to see. Um, towards the end, a Horizon Air, a QXE aircraft came over and was flying basically parallel. Him. That airplane was brought in from the higher altitude controller to find an opening of where they could see ground. Um, the only airplane on that frequency at that point was the aircraft in distress. They got rid of all the other airplanes that he had so that he could concentrate on that airplane. So in the background of all of this is numerous controllers pitching in, helping out, finding uh, airports with VFR conditions, getting pie reps, getting everything they can to help this pilot get out of the clouds. You'll notice a couple things that Josh did, Josh Pate is named. He was very calm. So he kept reassuring the pilot to keep the wings level. It's all we need is for you to keep the wings level and watch your altitude and airspeed. If you can do that, we can do the slow turns. He always asks for slow turns, which is basically your no gyro vector. This would be a no gyro vector, start turn now, stop turn. That would be the correct phraseology, but plain language in this case is what we're gonna use. Turn left, stop your turn. Um, a couple things with this, this is an approach control. They get one second updates on their radar scope. So they they have a much better, more much easier time doing no gyro vectors. At the center where I'm at, I'm at 12 second updates. So it's, it's a lot more left and right where I'm at trying to get an airplane to fly a straight line because my updates are so much slower. But um, this was a phenomenal save by this this uh, controller and the pilot kept his composure, wings level, kept the altitude that he could and, and got out of it. Um, so aircraft in weather difficulty. First thing we're gonna do, get your radar identified, um, find out where you're at, make sure what your altitude is. Then we're gonna ask if, if you're IFR qualified. If you are, file a flight plan. We're not gonna tell you to go to flight service pilot, but I, I need to know what you need, what you want, where are you going and how you wanna get there. So you tell me you wanna to go to Boeing Field Direct, Roger Clear to Boeing Field Direct. I maintain, and I'm gonna give you an altitude up above my my minimum IFR altitude to get you there. Um, so as soon as we know that you're IFR, it makes it a lot easier. We just give the IFR clearance where you go and assign you good safe altitude. When you're not IFR, that's when it becomes a problem. Find out that your VFR, that you're in the clouds. Um, we will verify the altitude. Um, we're going to suggest headings at that point. So where those altitudes were 5,300 feet, the lowest I can legally go is about a thousand feet above that in the approach environment. In the in route, it's even higher. It's 17 to 2,000 feet above that. It's the legal altitude that I can give you. You can't get up there. Um, whether it's icing or in the clouds, you don't want to climb, we just want to keep you level. So it's going to be suggested altitudes. I'm going to, I can tell you what the lowest absolute altitude is, like the 53, but I, I'm not going to tell you to maintain altitudes at that point like I would an IFR pilot. But um, we pull up the map, we'll know what the lowest is, and, and we'll ensure, make sure that you know what the very lowest is that, that you don't want to go below. All right, so this next video is. Um, Icing. So, a couple things about icing. It can happen anytime. So, standard lapse rate, two degrees, a thousand feet. Um, and again, this is, this is a big one where I'm not going to tell you to maintain an altitude below my minimum IFR altitude, but I'll suggest that. This one's still safe. Like I said, in the in route environment, mountainous terrain like Seattle is, I know that my minimum IFR altitude is 2,000 feet above the ground level. So I'm going to probably assign you somewhere down 1,500 feet below my minimum IFR, knowing that you can't hit the ground at that point. So we'll start this video. I'm not going to tell you to maintain an altitude below my minimum IFR altitude, but I'll suggest that this one's still safe. Like I said, in the in route environment, mountainous terrain like Seattle is. 
All right, Niner Delta Mike, I'm going to change your mind. I'm going to take you to runway 32 because that's going to get us a little bit closer, okay? All right, sounds good. By the way, the windows are so iced up, I see nothing. Yeah, it's kind of what I was afraid of. We'll see if we're going to get some runway. So we're going to turn up the lights for you um, and all that. Roger. All right, November 9 or Delta Mike, you're five miles from the runway 32 threshold. Just uh, turn right, heading 300, and let me know when you're established on that. Turning right, 300. Number 9 or Delta Mike on runway 32, the lowest I can get you is 1,440. So prepare to descend to that in about a mile. November 9 or Delta Mike, uh, are you on the 310 or uh, 300 heading? Working on it, though, about 31 right now. Okay, I need you back left. You're uh, right, of course, about a mile right, of course. And it looks like you're continuing in the right turn. How's that? I should be right on. All right, that looks a little bit better. Continue the left turn, heading 280 if you can. I can see absolutely nothing. I know. I need to get you down. I need you established on a heading a little bit closer to the runway. We're about three miles from the runway threshold, and uh, you're just ever so slightly right, of course. All right, Niner Delta Mike, this is looking better. Descend and maintain 1,400 feet. 1,400. And Niner Delta Mike, you're two and a half miles from the runway threshold, just right, of course. Uh, looks like you're correcting. It looks good. We have 310, and I'm trying to lose some altitude here. Remember, Niner Delta Mike Tower does say that you're clear to land on runway 32. Um, now you're turning back right again. I need you to turn left, left turn, about uh, 300 if you can. I'm trying to lock my airspeed indicator. I can see a little bit out the window. All right, I need you to keep turning left, though. You're turning away from the airport. All right, November 9th, Delta Mike, the airport is directly west of here. Do you see the ground okay, though? Just a little bit out of part of the window. Okay, turn left if you can, and uh, it'll be 270, um, and the airport will be right in front of you at that heading. November 9th, Delta Mike, you're a half mile away from the Madison Airport. It's just ahead and your left. If you can see anything, let me know. The lights are all the way up on all the runways. Really just a little bit out of the corner of the window and barely. All right, so you're not seeing the airport at all? I mean, I can take you out for an ILS, but I'm going to need to have you climb. You're getting really low. I got a full throttle. We're not going nowhere. Okay, the airport's just off to your left. Uh, it's 90 degrees to your left. You're less than a mile north of the airport. Niner Delta Mike, you're pretty much on a downwind for uh, runway 18 right, or for runway 36 right now. Um, just need you flying straight southbound. Okay, so... All right, I see, I see the airport. All right. Pick a runway and just put it down. Uh, wind is 050 at 10. Um, you're clear to land any runway. I got to find the runway. I can't even see which one is the runway, but I'm starting to be able to see a little bit here. Is he going to land? Uh, he's, uh, looks like he made it. Oh, he's rolling out three. Thank God. All right, good job, man. Okay, so so this plane, when he got down, ended up with two inches of ice on the um, wings of the aircraft. There was almost two inches of ice on it. The pilot could only see out of a very, very, very tiny little okay, square so. on the lower left of the windscreen. Um, Again, another amazing job by both the pilot um, and the air traffic controller to get this person down. This was a person in approach um, who was supposed to be taking a break to relieve the tower controllers. And as the aircraft called up uh, with problems, started to work it, made sure that his other controllers could do what they need, needed to to keep themselves working, um, use them to get the the lights and everything working, so lots of coordination in the background to help this out, but ends up getting everything um, safe, the aircraft down safe and the pilot home safe. Hey Eric, there's a good question that came in here. Um, 
Steve wants to know how much trouble are these pilots so, going to be in you know, after? When a problem comes up, just contact us. Get a hold of whoever you can. Um, hopefully, you got the frequency uh, ready to go. Take the problem as basically as you can. Again, the first thing we're going to do is the basic information. We're going to need the position, type aircraft, and altitude. Uh, once we have that and the radar, then we can find out what's going on and what you need. Uh, from there, we can get the resources to to help you back to the ground and, and rectify the situation. Um, at my facility, we have it's called the red binder. As soon as an aircraft calls with an aircraft with some type of a distress, the supervisor or the controller in charge grabs the red binder, brings it over the radar scope, and there's 15 different tabs of um, icing, aircraft in the clouds, uh, smoke in the cockpit, whatever. Go to that tab, open it up. It's got just lists of things to do for that pilot based on history and experiences and groups sitting down working it together to find out what the best course of action would be in every given situation and now every controller has that right at their fingers so that when an aircraft gets in trouble they can help them out as best they can okay so when it comes to weather capabilities for air traffic. We have two different types. There's the terminal weather and the in route weather. So terminal is going to be used by the towers and the radar approaches. Um, they have what's called STARS. I think it's standard terminal replacement system. Um, it's a colored screen. They get real time weather and they show six levels of precipitation. Uh, it's a little bit tough to see uh because they they vary so little but from talking to some of the approach controllers they have real quick action buttons they can press that they can get rid of the one and two and then three and four pop up so that they know where the moderate precipitation is or where the heavy is or where the extreme is but they can show six different types one being light which they don't use or disseminate Two being moderate, uh, so the blue with a few dots is moderate precipitation, three and four is heavy, and five and six would be extreme precipitation. In the en route, it's slightly delayed, um, up to 25 seconds, but again, way better than what our last system used to be. 25 seconds to three minutes currently, it used to be 15 minutes by the time we get the weather. There's three levels of precipitation. Um, light, modern, extreme, we will only call the, well, we will call all three of them. Uh, the little pluses are the uh, lightning strikes. So this is just another uh, zoomed in picture of that line of thunderstorms there. As you can see, starting in the upper right hand corner of this slide, planes don't want to fly through it. So all the way from the upper right corner, you can see I'm starting to head south down around the bottom of this weather. Looking at it, it looks to me like it's a high altitude sector with an ultra high above it. So all these airplanes are between 24,000 and 35,000 feet. And that's probably where the weather is because I see one right in the middle of the line of thunderstorm, just a couple five diagonal lines. That aircraft went right through it. My guess would be that's the ultra high sector working at, and it's probably like the Gulf Stream 5 up at 41, 45,000 feet, oh, he's going west bounds, 43,000 feet, and he topped the weather. The way the weather works in the in route environment is we can split it into three different altitude stratums. I can show from ground to 24,000 feet, I can show from 24,000 to 60,000, and then I can show ground to 60. So if the weather's only up to 11,000 feet, I can turn on my lowest stratum and I'll see the weather and I know that it's down low. I turn on my middle weather or my high weather and it's not there, okay, I don't have to worry about it up high. The problem is I only know that that weather is somewhere between the ground and 24,000. So when an aircraft comes over at 
23,000, he might tell me that he's well above it. So now I have to find another airplane that's down at 15 or, or something like that and find out what his flight conditions are. And if he is above it, or sometimes it could be below it, but I find out what his flight conditions are so that I can get a top support of that weather. And then I can start issuing it. The planes that want to go over it can, and the ones that don't can go around it. So onboard aviation weather, this is where I don't know what you guys have on board. With my limited pilot skills, I never got into much of, of the differences of what can be on board, and, and I certainly don't remember those from 23 years ago. Um, as far as air traffic controllers go, we have some uh, military experienced pilots. We have some that did some commercial flying. We have some that are very active private pilots. So they have knowledge. There's some like me that have flown an airplane. Um, but I would say the majority of our pilots, have, our controllers have not. So they don't know what's out there for you guys to have. This is where you need to know your capabilities and limitations of your equipment. But we'll just briefly go through a little bit. There's a pass of weather systems where the information is being sent to you in the cockpit, such as four flight, Sirius, ADSB, and then you got your active weather, which is going to be a, an onboard radar, which the bigger planes have. So this is a little video, if I can get it to go. This I think is four flight. I'm not even sure right offhand. Um, shows that the airplane should be in the weather. This little symbol there is inside the weather. So let's see if we can play this video. Okay, so as you can see, the web, the past of weather that he was receiving showed that he should be in the weather. When you look out the cockpit window, the weather's above him. It, in fact, it kind of looked like you can even possibly see the ground. It was a little hazy, but it looked like you could possibly even see the ground. So again, we get some information sent to us, but we have to know the limitations of it. So again, this plane flew right through the weather with no, no issue. Next time you try that, it, it may become an issue. Uh, a little bit about Sirius and ADSB. Uh, just some of the differences, different options that you guys have to you that you can choose. Um, know what works best for you. And if you're unsure, here's a uh, website that AOPA has provided that you can go see the differences and make the best choice for what works for you. Onboard weather radar is not perfect either. Um, it's got some issues, uh, contamination on the radome. So you get too much icing and it's not gonna give you good information. Uh, variable reflectivity, depending what kind of precipitation it is, if it's rain or hail or light snow, or can give you different readouts. Uh, and then the big ones that we hear from the airlines a lot, um, they can only see in front of them and they only have so much up and down. So a big one is when they're sitting on the runway waiting for takeoff and there's a thunderstorm off the end of the runway. They don't have the ability to zoom up high enough to see what it's going to look like until they get airborne. Uh, a couple other issues, range. Um, this one gets pilots in trouble sometimes because they're not looking out far enough. And so on the left-hand side, it looks like they can make it through those three little cells. But as you see on the right-hand side, all it did is they put them in a box of weather. So air traffic can help a little bit with this. We typically will have a bigger range that we can look at and, and give some suggestions that what you're thinking about there on the right-hand side isn't gonna work for you real well. Attenuation is just the fact that when your, your radome is looking at it, 
it makes it look like a, a small thin line of extreme weather because it's so thick it can't poke through it and see how bad it is and then when you actually get into it you see that it, it lasts a lot longer than than what you thought it was gonna so it's back again on my ways analogy it's an extra set of eyes if there's something out there that you want another pilot to know you be his set of eyes let air traffic know give him a pirate and then we can provide that to the other pilots Airmets, SIGMETs, convective SIGMETs, uh, interesting on the, the SIGMETs, they're going to go to a graphical display in the next couple of years. Um, SIGMETs are interesting for air traffic. We issue them every six hours, four times a day we issue them, and they're just blanket. They're for six states at a time. They, they're just so broad, it's people get tired of hearing them. So when it switches to graphical here in the future, it'll be much better. Um, then our weather advisories, if you're unsure what those are, it's basically SIGMETs and convective SIGMETs, but it's for a smaller area. So I think uh, SIGMETs need to cover, uh, I want to say 500 square miles before they get issued, where a center weather advisory is, is issued by the air traffic control center for much smaller areas. Um, might be 250 square miles, I'm not quite sure on that. Forecasting. Um, is how you're going to get a lot of your weather through your pre-flight briefing um, make sure you do that we can most definitely tell the pilots that don't get the ATISs, get the NOTAMs go up try to land on a closed runway it works the same with ATISs. get your get your pre-flight briefing don't get cognizant of the fact that you fly out of the airport day in and day out you know what the ATIS says all the time go ahead and get that information um, and don't get caught unaware of what of changing weather. So pirates, uh, like I said, there's certain criteria when we have to pass them on to flight service and and disseminate them. So the main ones are ceilings at or below five, visibility less than five, thunderstorms, turbulence of moderate or greater. So we won't do light turbulence. Icing is any anything light moderate or severe, um, wind shear, breaking action reports, volcanic ash is another one. I've actually, I work at Mount St. Helens. I've had to do volcanic ash fire ups. Um, so what we need from you, if you're talking to us on radar, we're already gonna have the time, the position, the type, I can see your altitude. So really at that point, all I need from you is what your pyre up is. Uh, whether it's icing, whether it's turbulence, whether it's tops and bases. If you're going over to flight service frequency to, to give that pyre up, you're going to have to give everything, all that information. The upper right-hand corner is a form, uh, automated form that I would fill out at my radar scope. My particular facility does not do this at the radar scope. We write it down on a, a form and pass it to the flight data specialist and they enter it and disseminate it. There are a lot of facilities in the airspace system that, that will fill it out right at the, the uh, sector or the radar scope, but it's all the same information, whether it's on a paper form or on this, and it gets disseminated out to flight service and to the pilots. And then just some simple threats to to weather, um, lack of onboard equipment. So you don't know what's out there, uh, whether you got an inaccurate forecast or didn't get a forecast, um, being in a rush, common. And then the whole get home-itis is always, always an issue that we can run into. Other than that, that's uh, all I have, unless there's questions. All right, thanks, sir. Appreciate that. Um, go ahead, put your headphones back on. I think you might be able to hear me better. Possibly. <laughs> all right, can you hear me now? There we go. Awesome. Can you hear me? I can. I, I have a delay, so I'm still talking in the background. It's okay. Well, um, 
sounds a little bit better, but uh, thank you very much for that and uh, really appreciate the, uh, the good information. We have some questions that have come in, uh, so I want to kind of go over those. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take back the screen here real quickly and just yes. um, get that to where we need to be. There we go. All right, awesome. And for those of you that asked that saw my, my desktop earlier, that's a picture of my son's graduating class taking on their freshman year when he went to school. Um, they're getting out in about three weeks, so I'm very excited. But anyhow, uh, enough about that. Um, Eric, some good questions that came in. Um, let's go back a little bit to the beginning. Um, there was a question, I think you kind of answered it in here, but uh, when we're talking about getting uh, weather information to you from the cockpit or from the flight deck, um, is it better to you know talk to you directly or should we go to flight service? Uh, 122.2 was mentioned, but I believe that was flight watch. That's not around anymore. So, or well, actually I guess that's probably a, a universal uh, flight service frequency. I, I might have misspoke there, but in any event, is it is it better to do that? I know you said the good pyreps probably are not going to get out of your sector location. So if you want those to be disseminated more widely, probably give them to flight service. But other stuff that might be of more um, immediate nature, those should go to you. So we, you're absolutely allowed to go to us. Absolutely allowed. And, and there's no issue why you shouldn't. Um, from what I think that I see happening on the other, from the pilot side is if they have something very routine, it seems that they're going to the nearest flight service RCO and passing it there. Mm -hmm. um, I will take it. I, one issue that we run into is when we get a lot of pyreps, and like I said, I don't intermit my radar scope. I give them to the flight data specialist is they get inundated on, on turbulent days. They get absolutely inundated with pyreps. And so it's one person up there entering pyreps one after the other. And, and so whether they can keep up or not, but yeah, you give them to the sector you're talking to. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, and speaking about uh, getting a lot of stuff where you're at, where somebody's asking for deviations, if your IFR and VFR conditions and or VFR are in the same, what's your preference in requesting timing uh, or in timing uh, or requesting a request for deviation around whatever it is that the pilot's trying to get around? Do you have a preference for that? Um, you know, it's it's the pilot's prerogative. I mean, we know that they are the pilot in command. We know that they have to be in charge of the airplane. If they don't want to fly their route and, and it's due to weather, just say it. Um, now, I don't work in extremely busy airspace. I, I can deviate, let, I can allow planes to deviate 99% of the time, and I don't even pin them down to a, a degree or a, much of anything. I'll let them let them do it. Um, when I start getting into ride complaints or weather that I need planes to deviate, I automatically go to altitude separation. I don't keep two airplanes at the same altitude. I get them at different altitudes, and then they can go wherever they want. But I don't work Chicago approach. I don't work Atlanta approach. So um, they're going to be stricter, but they, they're still going to let them go around weather. Okay. A um, couple comments of, uh, and a question related to the videos that we watched. First of all, um, you, you can really tell uh, the professionalism and the controllers that are helping out these two pilots that were in need and how they maintained their calm uh, and their cool collectiveness when they were on the radio. Heard a little bit of frustration that last controller when he was talking to his, his uh, buddy over at the tower there. It's like, oh, God, thank goodness he's down. And, and I, I, can, I can understand that feeling definitely. But um, you guys really train hard to do that, and I think that's that's good. And I and I know as a pilot myself, a couple of times being in a situation where I needed some extra assistance from ATC, I appreciated that calm voice on the other side of the radio when I might have been, well, I won't say freaking out, but I was certainly not comfortable in the cockpit. Um, the question is, and I know the answer to this, but I, I, I think you know the answer to this too. I, I certainly hope you do. How much trouble were these guys actually going to get in? Did they get in any trouble? And is that one of those myths that we need to bust tonight about 
you know, if you request help and you get it and you come out of it okay, are you really in trouble? So I, I think a myth is that we uh, get pilots in trouble. We, we don't, um, flight standards does. Okay, so it, if, if anybody's gonna go after a pilot, it's flight standards, it's not air traffic. Air traffic works the situation. They record the event on our daily log because when somebody calls in to ask about it, we have to make sure that everybody up to the manager knows the situation, that nobody is blindsided that, hey, you guys had this huge issue the other night with a jet airliner in distress and and the manager's like what so so we work it we log it and that's it um we have to issue the brasher statement possible pilot deviation right. contact facility um most of the time when that call comes in it is a educational call only and this is not necessarily for weather emergencies it's it we're kind of more tending towards um, non-conformance with the clearance, mm -hmm. but but um, as far as you a pilot getting into weather, uh, if flight standards looks at that, I'm I'm not sure at all how that comes. But I have heard um, while we were at Oshkosh this last year, we had a flight standards, a former flight standards uh, employee in the audience, and he made sure to stand up at the end of the briefing and say that that he believes there is a larger push in flight standards to educate and not punish. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I would have to say that um, I have rarely heard of a pilot being punished for asking for help when they've gotten themselves into a situation and they've gotten out of it. Um, you know, that is that is something that we've talked about in ASI. Um, you know, you're you're not going to get in trouble for asking for help. So my point to all the pilots out there and to the instructors that are teaching the pilots, make sure you teach them how to ask for help. You know, have them declare an sure. emergency. If you're thinking about it, you probably should do it, you know, and, and just get that extra help, get the, get the attention that you need and to get out of that situation before it becomes worse. Because honestly, I don't want to have to talk about you in any of my future seminars or webinars. You know, I, I'd, I'd like to get work myself out of a job if I possibly can. And that would be, that would be something that, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to do uh, with this. Um, and so with that, there's a couple other things where I know we're, we're, we're well over time. Um, we had some technical difficulties, so I do appreciate people hanging sure. in there. If you, can I jump in one second on the emergency? Sure. sure. The, uh, we, so a pilot can declare an emergency and they do, and, and they should let us know they're in trouble. The word doesn't need to be said. I mean, when, when a pilot needs help, we're going to treat it as an emergency. You will sometimes hear a controller say, I'm declaring an emergency for you. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do that either. We, it doesn't have to be said. Um, like I said, it does need to be an emergency to go below my minimum altitudes and whatnot. But I can just tell my supervisor or my manager that, listen, I was treating this like an emergency. And, and so I'm doing that. So um, stating an emergency, it, it oftentimes is being declared whether the pilot knows it or not. And so Steve, I think that asks, answers your question that you just asked, um, that stating that you know neither of the pilots had called for an emergency, but they were being handled as one. It was just kind of a tacit agreement, understood that, yeah, they're in trouble. They need to, uh, need to do a question. Uh, another question related to it, um, yeah, I just lost it here. Um, well, in any event, um, it, was a, it was a statement about, uh, you know, when you're submitting, a, are you going to get in trouble for submitting a PIREP, for example, that you're in light icing in an aircraft that's certainly not certified for flight into known icing? Is that going to get you in trouble? I don't think it will. I think that's the information that's going to get out and that's going to be helpful to people flying in that sector and that you can pass along as a, as a controller to others say, yeah, I have reports of icing at this altitude and uh, you know, you can, you can make them aware of that. Um, so 
I think what we'll do, I'll, I'm going to close the Q&A with this. We had a really great, uh, great comment in. Joe, thank you very much for this. And, and Eric, this is for you and your fellow controllers out there in Seattle. Uh, he said he's flown in various centers and Seattle has been the, bre uh, been the best for assisting the pilots. Bravo. So, you know, uh, obviously that, that first video is from, uh, from your center, I believe. And uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, I know we're, we're, we're over time, so let me run into um, how you can get uh, credit for all this. Uh, first of all, um, just a few, a few things to um, keep in mind. The, um, the next webinar will be May 26th. Uh, that is our second episode of the NTSB Insider Series. That's titled Finding the Golden BB. That is a date change. So you may have had it on your calendar for May the 19th. We needed to make that change so we could get the presenter in. So please mark that on your calendar. It's May 26th. You will get, if you, if you registered for that series of uh, webinars, you will get a reminder email uh, in a few weeks letting you know that, yes, it will be at May 26th, 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Wings credit for this webinar. Uh, we have a few questions that came in in the chat. If you registered for this and you don't know if you registered with your faasafety.gov uh, email address that you used when you set up your account there, go ahead, send it to us in the questions, or you can send it to me directly at john, J-O-H-N, dot Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S, at aopa.org. Again, that's my first name, John, with an H, a period, my last name, Collins, at aopa.org. I'll make sure you get that credit. You should see it in your account by Monday afternoon. That's one of my tasks tomorrow. So when I get back into the office, uh, if you want to watch this again, the Air Safety Institute has a YouTube channel where we put all of our videos, our accident case studies, our real pilot stories, our, our webinars, our uh, safety videos, all of that stuff is there. So please check that out. You can also go to our website to webinars.aopa.org and you can get uh, watch it there, share it with your friends, give them this information so they are as safe as you are as we're out there. Now let's talk a little bit about the AOPA Pilot Passport and how you can get that ASI webinar badge redemption. First of all, you have to have the app. So it's the AOPA Pilot app. Uh, the passport is part of that. And so uh, over here where my uh, number one is, you can see that is the uh, quick launch menu. Pilot Passport is right there. You can also get to it from the menu in the upper left-hand corner and just click on that and drop down. And then you'll see what is over here. Number three, click on My Pilot Passport. That will bring up the next page, My Points and Badges. And what you're looking for down there is Redeem Affiliate Code. Okay, Redeem Affiliate Code down there. Just tap on that down by the number four. That will open up the Redeem Affiliate Code page. Number five, type the code in there. This month's code is ASI. WEB041422, that's ASI Web 041422. That's valid until the end of the month. And then, of course, next month we will get another one. But I'll make it a little valid a little bit further out than the end of May since we're so close to the end of May. We'll make sure that works there. Um, so you can get that passport badge. You'll get that badge. It'll show up in your, in your uh, passport. You'll also get 1,000 points for the leaderboard. So you can advance yourself in that. If you're interested in adding this to your ASI transcript and you want to get a certificate of completion, please write down this URL, https colon forward slash forward slash bit, B-I-T dot L-Y slash capital W-X-F L-Y-N-I-N-G, the number one, and the letters C E R T. So weather flying one cert after the bit.ly, and you'll get to the transcript. You can make sure you add that in there. You can download a uh, certificate of completion. I know some of you use that. Your insurance companies like to see that. We like to see you do that. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate your attending tonight. Uh, in the ASI, we believe that a trained pilot is giving good safety information and is developing a good culture of safety, flying well maintained equipment is going to be much less of a hazard to you. I, like I said earlier, I don't want to talk about you folks in my upcoming webinars. So please, 
fly safely. And if you've enjoyed this and you want to contribute towards us being able to do more of this, uh, a good bit of our uh, funding for the work that we do comes through the AOPA Foundation and donations from pilots and aviation enthusiasts like yourself. Finally, I hope you're all AOPA members, but if you're not and you like this webinar and you want to become part of the biggest GA community in the world, aopa.org slash join today. Uh, and you can get there, you can sign up, and you can receive access to our website, to all the areas of the website, uh, the Air Safety Institute information, that's all pretty much free. The only thing I charge for is our flight instructor refresher courses, but all our other safety information is free. It's available on our website. Uh, then you also get access to our AOPA pilot magazine or flight training magazine, and access to our 800 number where we have uh, flight instructor, mechanics, and medical specialists that are there ready and willing to answer your questions and to give you good, accurate information that you can continue to go out and fly safely and enjoy the beautiful thing that we have called general aviation. It is actually fun. I was down at Sun and Fun all last week, and if, I, if you can't tell, I came back kind of pumped up about GA. So I hope to be out at Oshkosh this summer. We'll see you out there. In the meantime, from all of us here at AOPA, and again, thank you to NATCA for allowing Eric to come on and talk with us tonight about air traffic control and how they can help us, and how we can be better pilots in the system. Thank you very much. Have a good evening and fly safe. <laughs>